for life. Uh, I want to start with a little bit of a riddle. And the riddle is this. What sings but makes no sound? What sings but makes no sound? And while you're pondering that for a minute, let me give you some context on where we are. Uh, We're in the middle of a a series called Habits, where we're kind of examining uh, the behaviors and the daily disciplines that are hallmarks of the Christian life. What does it mean practically and in our behaviors and the things we do every day to be a disciple of Jesus? We've talked about things like the habit of generosity, the habit of reading scripture, the habit of prayer. We're going to continue in that series today by examining the habit of worship. And I'll be honest with you guys, this is a habit that has not always come easily to me. In fact, if you could kind of uh, peer through time and space back to the mid-90s to the chapel of the Christian school that I went to, you'd see a lot of things. You'd see some really baggy dress shirts and some braided leather belts and some ties that may or may not have been clipped in place. But what you would not have seen would have been a lot of young men actually worshiping during a worship service. See, I don't know what it's like for kids now, but back then, um, we very badly wanted to be perceived as strong and tough and manly, cool. And the perception was that singing out loud in any setting was not strong or tough or manly or cool. And really showing any kind of emotion was not any of those things, or, or giving any kind of indication that you had a spiritual life at all was not strong or tough or manly or cool. And so if you could see into one of those chapel services now, what you would see would be a lot of young men uh, during the worship segment kind of just standing like this. And I was there standing among them, and I, I certainly wanted to be perceived as, as strong and tough and all that stuff, but... I also came from a church that had a really vibrant worship culture, you know, similar to what we had here this morning. And so I knew somewhere in my heart that I I should be worshiping in these moments. So the best thing I could come up with was this compromise, where I thought maybe I could get credit with God for worshiping, but not lose credit with my friends for being cool. So all my friends were standing there stone-faced. I kind of did something like this. Open the eyes of my heart, Lord. Eyes of my heart. Like, I was worshiping, but I didn't want anybody to know that I was worshiping. So in case you haven't figured out the answer to the riddle, what sings but doesn't make a sound is Brian in the eighth grade. <laughs> there are a lot of things that I wish were different about that time. There are things that I wish that school had done differently. They did a lot of things great. One of the things I wish they had done differently in that moment about worship is I wish they hadn't hammered home this message that to worship you have to be dressed like an accountant, because that was stupid. (laughs) But what I wish they had taught us was that worship is an incredible source of strength. And if you want to be strong and you want to be tough and you want to be manly, you need worship in your life. We see a wonderful example of this in the Bible in the character of David. Because David is the greatest warrior in the history of Scripture. And he's also the greatest worshiper in the history of Scripture. And that is not a coincidence. You know, David is, is the one who started as a shepherd and then, you know, killed Goliath and became a, a folk hero and a military leader. And then at one point he was a, a fugitive and then he became king and he was this amazing hero. And in his life he had incredible triumphs and incredible tribulation. But no matter whether he was riding high or riding low, he worshiped through all of it. So much of, of what we have in the book of Psalms today is composed of songs that he wrote during those high moments and during those low moments, but no matter what kind of moment it was, he made sure that we knew that the source of his strength was that worship relationship with God. So as we examine 
the role that the habit of worship plays in our lives. I think we can start with some things that David had to say about worship. I think that's a great place to jump off from. So I want to begin in Psalm 33. This is a psalm that David wrote. Verses 1 and 2 we're going to look at. This is what it says. Sing joyfully to the Lord, you righteous. It is fitting for the upright to praise him. Praise the Lord with the harp. Make music to him on the ten-string lyre. Now, look, there are a lot of ways to worship. If you've been around churches for a while, you probably hear people say uh, that giving is an act of worship, uh, that uh, serving is an act of worship, uh, loving your spouse and your kids well is an act of worship, being a faithful witness in a fallen world is an act of worship, and all those things are true. But David is putting his finger on something really specific here. He's saying if you are someone who loves God, if you are someone who is righteous, then you were made to worship him in song. David's saying there is a power in music, and God created music for you to use it to commune with him through worship. It says it is fitting for the upright to praise him. Fitting means that it was designed just for that purpose. If something fits you just right, that means it was made for you. Or it means that you were made for it. And David's saying in this case, it is both. That you were made to worship God and God made music for you to encounter him through musical worship. Another psalm, Psalm 22, David adds another important element to this. In Psalm 22, 22, he says, I will proclaim your name to my brothers and sisters. I will praise you among the assembled people. So David is saying not only is worship a musical experience, but worship is a corporate experience. God made you to worship him through music, and he made you to do it with people. See, I think what the scripture is trying to tell us here about worship is that disciples of Jesus worship him together. Disciples of Jesus worship him together. And if you're the kind of person who loves music and you're, you're very emotionally expressive, uh, you're like, yeah, this is awesome. Let's go. I'm all about it. Wrap it up so we can get back to the music. Sorry, that's not going to happen. But if you're the kind of person who is maybe a lot like I was, who's uncomfortable with emotion, who's uncomfortable with expressions of spirituality, who's maybe uncomfortable with the sound of your own voice, then this can be a little bit harder to swallow. It can be a little bit harder to onboard in your life and say, yes, I'm committing myself to this discipline of the Christian life. If you're one of those people, I've got good news for you. Hang on, we'll get there. But I think it's important to know that anytime God asks us to do something, even if it's something that is difficult, he asks us to do it for two reasons. He asks us to do it for his glory and for our good. And so when he asks us to come together corporately and worship with song, singing out loud, even if that's very hard for you, he's asking you to do it not just so that he can be glorified, but so that he can do something good in your life. You see, there is something that God wants to do in your life through you singing out loud with your voice with other people to him. So we're going to spend our time today talking about what that is. What are the things that God wants to do in your life and in my life through worshiping together? We'll jump right in. First thing that God wants to do in your life and in my life is to bring healing. Because worship brings healing. You know, David... Um, he had some incredible highs, but he had some devastating lows. 
And maybe the lowest moment in his life came when he was already king. He had already had wild success, but he made an enormous mistake. And he committed adultery with a woman and got her pregnant. And then to cover up the pregnancy, he arranged to have her husband killed and then took her into the palace as his wife to try to cover it up so that nobody would realize what had happened. But God, of course, saw what happened, and God sent a prophet to David to call him out on his sin. And in the process of that conversation, God said through the prophet, this child that was conceived in this act of sin, because of your sin, this child is going to die. We're not going to be able to go through all the story for the sake of time, but I, I, I do want to take you through some portions of it. So we're going to pick this up right here in 2 Samuel chapter 12, starting in, in verse 16. David begged God to spare the child. He went without food, and he lay all night on the bare ground. Today we might call that a portrait of a pretty classical depression. He can't eat, he can't sleep, he can't get himself, himself up off the hard ground. He's desperate. Then on the seventh day, the child died. I'm going to skip ahead just a bit. Then David got up from the ground, washed himself, put on lotions, and changed his clothes. And look at what he does next. He went to the tabernacle and worshipped the Lord. After that, he returned to the palace and was served food. David went through a week of pretty hellish circumstances. And when the story was over, when there was nothing left to do, he went back to the habit that had sustained him his whole life. See, he was at the lowest moment of his life. But in that lowest moment, he knew where to go to find healing because he had walked that path to the presence of God many, many times before. And I think it's interesting to note here, it doesn't say uh, David sung some songs in his bedroom and it made him feel better. And it doesn't say David called for a priest to come and minister, uh, minister to him in the privacy of the palace and he found some healing there. No, it says David got himself dressed, basically, and then he went to the tabernacle. He went to the house of God where the people of God were gathered together in worship and he worshiped with them in the tabernacle and there he found healing. Why do we know he found healing? Because he hadn't eaten anything for a week. And then after he worships, the Bible says, he returned to the palace and was served food and ate. I don't know where you are in life today, and I hope you're not in a, a place of desperation and grief and loss. But if you're not, I, I know one thing is certain. Either you have been before or you will be at some point. And it's very, very easy to feel in those moments of desperation and grief and loss. It's very easy to feel like you can't get out of bed. You can't leave the house. You can't face people. And my goodness, how could you ever begin to sing? But I think one of the things God is saying here is in those moments when you feel it the least are probably the times when you need it the most. Because if you will let him, God will use a moment of corporate worship to meet you and begin to bring some healing into the painful points in your life. I'll never forget, this is 10 and a half, 11 years ago. I'll never forget being with Laura in a room uh, in a doctor's office looking at a, an ultrasound screen. Sorry. <laughs> looking at an ultrasound screen and this doctor saying, congratulations, you're having twins. And I was like, what? Like, I literally said, what? Because uh, it was exciting and it was terrifying. Because nobody's ready for, for kids, period. Ain't nobody's ready for twins ever. He said, congratulations, you're having twins, and it was awesome. Uh, I'll also never forget a couple weeks later being back in that room and looking at that screen and, and the doctor struggling to find a heartbeat. 
And as the scene unfolded, we realized that these twins were, um, were kids we were never going to get to meet. And uh, Laura was obviously devastated. And I kind of fell back into an old dad habit, which was be strong, be tough, don't show any emotion. And I told myself I was, I was just focused on being strong for my wife. The truth was, you know, I can see this now, um, as long as I was leaning into being strong and tough, I didn't have to face the, the devastating reality for myself. But it went on this way for months. Uh, it, was, it was complicated, and, you know, if you ever have friends or, or you ever go through a, a situation like this, it can take a lot longer than you might expect for the situation to resolve. And so about five months later, uh, I had been walking that path of, of being strong and tough the whole time until about five months later, I went to uh, a worship conference with some friends uh, in Atlanta one weekend. Laura wasn't able to go, so it was just me and my friends and a few hundred other people. And on the Saturday morning of that conference, uh, it started with a very, very simple worship service, two guys with guitars. That was it. And it, it just kind of started normally, and I started singing with, with everybody else, but something about being in that place with those people who cared about me and, and honestly, Laura not being there so I didn't have to keep the facade up. God broke something about two minutes into that worship service and the wall just came down and I collapsed into the chair and I ugly cried for like 15 minutes straight. It was like my friends were like, is he okay? <laughs> I mean, they, they knew they knew what was going on. But God had to bring me to that place of confronting my grief so that he could then bring me through it and heal me from it. So that a couple months later, when we started the journey to the, the parenting life we have now, that I could do that from a place of healing and not a place of hurt. God did that in my life in a moment of worship, of singing together with his people in his house. Worship brings healing. Another thing that worship brings is freedom. Worship brings freedom. We're going to fast forward to the New Testament now. Look at something that happened in the life of Paul. He's on one of his missionary journeys with a friend named Silas. They've gone to a town to preach. They have been uh, horribly mistreated, uh, falsely accused, arrested, beaten, and thrown in prison. And that's where we pick up the story. They're in prison. In Acts 16, starting in verse 25, it says, About midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God, and the other prisoners were listening to them. Suddenly there was such a violent earthquake that the foundations of the prison were shaken. And all at once, all the prison doors flew open, and everyone's chains came loose. Uh, if you've ever been horribly mistreated, you may know that it's really easy to let rage consume you, let your anger and bitterness consume you, and consume all your private moments, and consume your late nights, and you just stay awake seething about what happened. But notice here that at midnight, Paul and Silas choose worship instead of rage, instead of anger, instead of bitterness. And, and they weren't worshiping like a middle school boy. They were singing loud enough that everybody else was listening to them. And God used that moment of intentional, voluntary worship to intervene in their story and set them free. And not just them, but everyone around them. And then use that freedom to actually spread the gospel further in that city. And I don't think that Paul and Silas were sitting there worshiping because life was so awesome. And they were so happy. I think they were worshiping because they were victims of injustice. I think they were worshiping because their bodies were broken. I think they were worshiping because they were desperate and didn't see any other way out. And thankfully, none of us in this room today are prisoners for our faith. 
But that doesn't mean that none of us are bound and captive by something. Maybe it's a behavior you can't seem to shake. Maybe it's some kind of addiction. Maybe it is words that someone spoke over your life long ago that have haunted you for years. Maybe it's an unjust situation that you are going through. Whatever it is, I want you to know that God can set you free from that. And he can do it and he will do it in a moment of worship. And much like the way that grief holds us back from worship, these chains of shame or addiction or oppression, they can make us feel like we're not even worthy to approach the throne of God. That we can't even utter a word because we don't deserve to be his children. But again, I want to tell you those moments where you feel like you can do it the least are the moments when you need it the most. And so when you are chained by something, when you are held captive by something, when you are oppressed by someone, that is the time to go to the presence of God and worship with people and believe that in that moment of worship, God will set you free. A few years ago, I got an opportunity to interview for my dream job. I mean, like dream of dream jobs. This was a, an opportunity to work very closely with someone who was a hero of mine uh, in a very high profile role that had a, the possibility for a giant impact in the world and in the kingdom of God. Also would have paid really well, but that's beside the point. This was a huge opportunity. And so I started going through the interview process, and it was good, and I talked to some people there, and it was good, and it was really good, and I was excited, and I, like, Laura and I were making plans to move to Nashville, honestly. I mean, like, we were, we felt like this was, like, God was doing this. And then things started to get a little weird, and then they started to get real weird, and I'm not going to go into the whole story, but, but it got, like, manipulative and unreasonable and strange and and super, super weird to the point where it, it felt abusive. And about five months after I started the recruitment process with them, I got an unsigned email from their HR system saying thanks, but no thanks. Like they didn't even have the decency after five months of dragging me through this to, to sign their name to it and say, we're not moving forward with you and here's why. And I was furious. Laura was really furious. And my anger over that situation lasted for months. For weeks after it happened, it was all I could talk about. I mean, seriously, like if I, if I talked to you in the weeks after this, you heard about it, and I'm sorry that I put you through that. <laughs> and and for, for months, it was all I could think about when I laid down at night. I would dream about this situation at night. And I honestly did not know how to get free from this thing that was occupying all of my brain space. And then one Sunday, we were here in worship. I still remember I was, I was standing like right there, two or three rows back, right next to Lara, in a worship service just like, just like this morning, just like a few minutes ago. And in that moment a thought dropped into my heart that was one of those thoughts that is so out of left field and so outside of what is going on in my brain that I knew it had to come from the Holy Spirit. You ever had those, those thoughts? And the, the thought that the Holy Spirit dropped into my heart, it was two parts. Number one was, what they did to you was wrong. And number two was, you have to forgive them. Now, I knew the first part already. And, and the part of me that spent my whole life going to Christian school should have known the second part already. <laughs> but it took the Spirit of God reminding me for me to see that my bitterness and unforgiveness over this situation had taken me captive. 
and was dominating my life. It was holding me back from better things that God had for me. And so, standing right there in the middle of, of a worship song, I began the process in my heart of saying, God, I forgive them. I want to forgive them. Please help me forgive them. Every now and then, I still have to say, God, please help me forgive them. Especially when his ugly, bald face shows up in my timeline. I shouldn't have said that. I should have saved that for the second service when it wasn't being recorded. <laughs> worship brings healing. Worship brings freedom. Final thing that I want to talk about this morning is that worship brings joy. There's a place in Ephesians where Paul is writing to a young church in Ephesus, and he says this, uh, Ephesians 5, 18. He says, don't be drunk with wine, because that will ruin your life. Instead, be filled with the Holy Spirit, singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs among yourselves and making music to the Lord in your hearts. I love how blunt he is here. Don't get drunk with wine, because that will ruin your life. Now, this isn't a sermon about drinking, but what I want to point out to you is that the world has a script for how you are supposed to have a good time, and the world has a script for how you are supposed to find joy. And what Paul's saying is, hey, that script is broken because it doesn't work and it will ruin your life if you keep going down that road. So he says, instead, let me show you a script that is better. Let me show you something that works. And something that works is what? It's being filled with the Spirit and singing praises and psalms and hymns and spiritual songs and singing them where? Among yourselves, to each other. In other words, what he's saying is this whole culture of going out and partying and getting drunk and getting wasted is just a shabby substitute for the true source of joy that comes with abandoning yourself in worship in the presence of God with your brothers and sisters. That is the source of joy that God made for you. And it doesn't ruin your life. It actually makes your life better. If you're an adult, most of you are adults, you have probably been in a situation where you are with or around or nearby someone or some group of people that have been drinking a lot, and you have not. And in those moments when I've, I've been in a situation like that, you know, with rowdy neighbors or people staying in the next room at a hotel or something like that, it's striking, number one, um, how, how much it can sound like they're having a good time. Like, they think they're having a really good time. The other thing that's striking is just how completely dumb they sound, right? Like, they, they think everything they say is genius and it's funny and they're laughing. In the, in the meantime, you're sitting there like, you're an idiot. That wasn't funny. This isn't fun. This isn't a good time. It's just very stupid. And, and the way that substances like this work is they just literally make you dumber. That's all that's happening here. You know, when you, when you drink too much, it just clouds your brain's ability to see reality. And since you can't see and process reality as well, you're not looking at the difficult realities of your life, and so it feels like you get a break from them, and maybe you even get a little bit of joy. Of course, it doesn't remove those realities. They're still there the next day, along with some other painful realities that weren't there, and they just make your life worse. But worship is different. See, worship does not remove your grasp of reality. Worship actually improves your grasp of reality. Because see, when I'm focused on the circumstances of my life, whether they're good or bad, that's kind of all I can see. But when I focus my heart on God and what he has done for me in a moment of worship, I start to see a higher reality that is more real than the circumstances that I'm trying to escape. And so when I'm 
engaged with God in worship. It doesn't matter that my hero rejected me because the creator of the universe called me and set me apart and said I am his and that I am a co-laborer and co-heir with Christ. That's the higher reality. And that brings an incredible amount of joy. And when I'm engaged with God in worship, it's still true that I have two kids that I never got to meet. But what's more true than that is that they are safer and more loved in his arms than they ever would have been in mine. And one day, I will get to meet them. And they're going to get to meet the me that has been fully perfected by the love of God. And that brings a lot of joy. And that's a joy that lasts. That joy is not gone the next morning. But it's a joy that sustains me and will sustain you through the most difficult moments of life if you will engage with the presence of God among the people of God and worship him. Worship brings healing. Worship brings freedom. Worship brings joy. Now, if you're a skeptical person, you might think, well, Brian, it really sounds like what you're talking about is just an emotional reaction to music. Because music is powerful, it can move us emotionally, and so, you know, you, you come to church and the, the songs are pretty and the singers are good and it, it has an emotional impact on you. That's all well and good, but that's not like supernatural. And there's a, a very rational, logical part of me that would tend to agree. If it were not for one more thing that the Bible teaches about worship. And that one more thing is this. Worship is powerful because there is a person behind the power. There is a person behind the power. And so when I step into a moment of worship, it impacts me not because the music is great. It impacts me because I am encountering a person who is powerful. I want to show you something that the writer of Hebrews wrote. In Hebrews chapter 2, verse 11, we're going to read this and then I'm going to unpack it because there's, it's kind of buried a little bit below the surface. He says, both the one who makes people holy, that's Jesus, and those who are made holy, that's us, are of the same family. So Jesus is not ashamed to call them brothers and sisters. He says... I will declare your name to my brothers and sisters. In the assembly, I will sing your praises. You recognize those verses? We've seen them before. See, those are the same verses that David wrote in Psalm 22 that we looked at a few minutes ago. And what's amazing here that the writer of Hebrews is saying is that what David wrote as praise God used as prophecy. Because what he's saying here, he's referring to Jesus. Jesus is not ashamed to call them brothers and sisters. He says. So the writer of Hebrews is saying this thing that David wrote, he's actually attributing to Jesus. And David wrote centuries before Jesus was born, but he wrote something that one of his offspring centuries later would claim as his own words in his own heart. And so what this means is that these two verses that we just read from Psalms are coming from Jesus' own mouth. So Jesus says, I will declare your name to my brothers and sisters. In the assembly, I will sing your praises. In the assembly, that's this, here now. Jesus is saying, I will sing your praises. 
In other words, what he's saying is that when we gather and worship together, Jesus is here worshiping with us. And he is the person behind the power. He is here worshiping with us. And I love that because it means it doesn't matter how bad we are at worship. See, Jesus is the presence of God in our worship, and he is the perfection of God in our worship. And so that means that if your heart is so broken that you can barely squeak out a word, then Jesus is singing with you and through you and for you. And if you're so oppressed by something that you can barely lift your head, Jesus is here with you and worshiping with you and through you and for you. And if you have such a janky voice that you can't carry a tune in a bucket, here's the good news I was telling you about. It doesn't matter because Jesus is here and he is singing with you and through you and for you. And the power of Jesus in your worship overshadows any gnarly sound that can come out of your mouth. It doesn't matter because Jesus is here. And so the reason that worship brings healing is that Jesus allowed his body to be broken so that by his stripes we could be healed. And the reason that worship brings freedom is that Jesus died on the cross to set us free from the law of sin and death. And the reason that worship can bring us joy is that because he rose from the grave, we have eternal life that is more true and more real than any crappy circumstance we can find ourselves in in this world. Worship brings healing and freedom and joy because Jesus brings healing and freedom and joy. And when we worship together, He's here with us. Worshiping together connects us to Christ. Connects us to Christ. In a minute, we are going to worship together again. Before we do, though, if you all would just close your eyes for a minute, bow your heads. I want to take a moment and give an opportunity for anybody in this room who feels disconnected from Christ to restore that connection today. Maybe there's been a time in your life where you were connected to Christ, but then you, you made some bad decisions or you got in some bad habits and that connection has been severed. Maybe you have never really had a relationship with Jesus. And so you hear me talking about uh, a Jesus who brings healing and freedom and joy, and you say, I have never known that Jesus. And so I've never had those things in my life. And I want to give you an opportunity to begin or restore that connection right now. And so if that's you, I would encourage you just to pray along with me in your own heart, in your own words, something like this. Say, Jesus, I believe that you are the son of God and that you lived a perfect life and that you died so that I could be in relationship with you. And I accept the work that you did on the cross. And I give you my, my broken and sinful life and accept your perfect life in me in exchange. Come and live in me. And work in me. And have a relationship with me. I give you everything. I give you everything. Guys, can we celebrate anybody who is making that decision today? Uh, 
uh, if you made that decision today, I would love for you to let us know. You can uh, text the church. You can write a note on your connection card. Say, hi, I decided to, to start a relationship with Jesus or um, I decided to renew my relationship with Jesus. We would love to hear from you either way so that we can resource you and help you and come alongside you.